Well, hello and welcome to the Godwit Podcast for another week. I'm Paul Smith. And I'm David Kowalik and we're going to start a short series. We've already started it, except it wasn't short. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, we're going to deal with some really key words, some words that have significant meaning in the Bible and significant meaning that is thrown around in churches and in church history that can sometimes, because of the context in which they're said and the way that they're used, they can lose some of the original meaning. Mm. So what we're wanting to do is ground these words in a truly biblical and historical um, context in the context in which they were first used. Yep. So we want to try to reestablish what those words meant to the gospel writers and to the apostles and to the first believers and then pick up what they thought it meant then to, and then bring that into our contemporary context and say, well, if that's what it meant to them then, does it still mean the same thing now or are we using the words in the wrong way? Yeah. And I would suspect that some of the words, well, I you know, certainly discovered it for myself, that some of the words that we take for granted, that we understand the meanings of, I've, I've personally come to realise, actually, maybe I didn't. Maybe I need to review what the early gospel writers thought it meant and maybe that will change the way I see it as well. Yeah. So... Um, one of those words, of course, and it's a biggie, is faith. Yeah. So what do, what do we generally think the word faith means? Say if you were to talk to the average person in a Western evangelical church today and say, do you have faith, what would, I, what would they think I was asking them to tell me? There's kind of two main ways I think that mm. most contemporary people use it. Yeah. The George Michael way, which is when Christians use it, mm. it's the Christian version of the secret. Yeah. You know that book? Yeah. The Secret? Yeah, yeah. Like manifesting mm -hmm. if you kind of – Just hold put, the line. Yeah. yeah. I think we said in another recent episode on mm -hmm. um, you know, talking about righteousness because yeah. we have talked about faith in that series because there's a, a very strong link between mm. faith and righteousness and mm. faith and justification. So if you watched um, that series, which was supposed to be the start of the keyword series – Yeah. It's only going to be one episode turned into what eight? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, we've already said a little bit about what what faith is, but in in one of those, we said that uh, a lot of people use faith as like positive vibes to the universe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and that's what George Michael was saying. Mm. If, you know, I'm putting out positive vibes to the universe, mm. and then um, maybe I can get a little bit of action. Yeah, and I guess the word of faith guys tend to go down that angle as well. That <clears> if you can hang on to positive thinking and and have a positive vibe and just keep, you know, keep hoping for the best, then the universe will reward you, that kind of thing. Yeah. So, yeah, I guess most Word of Faith guys would think in that way, which, of course, is a million miles away from what the Bible talks about. But uh, the other way, of course, is this kind of being holding to theological truths about God or about something to do with God. So, for instance, um, you know, you might look up a catechism or a, or a creed or something and say, I believe all the things that are in the creed and that's what faith is. I believe that God is Trinity, is Father, Son and Holy Spirit, that he was born of the Virgin Mary and you know, crucified under Pontius Pilate, was dead, raised from the dead, blah, blah, blah. I shouldn't blah, blah, blah the creed, should I? But whatever, I just did. Um, but if So a lot of people would say, if I believe that the facts, the, the, the essential things that are in the creed, then I'm a believer. Um and look, I'm going to have to be honest and say there, there is a, an element of truth in that, but that's not the main way. It's not the lion's share of the way that the word faith is used in the Bible and certainly not what Jesus was meaning when he was talking about faith. Mm -hmm. So um, I think you know, I think we have touched on this in not, uh, not only this more recent series but in earlier stuff about the kingdom of God as well, that faith is more to do with giving an allegiance and trust to someone. A, um, as I heard, was it Michael Heiser puts it as loyal? Believing loyalty. Yeah, believing loyalty. That's, that's a pretty good way of putting it. Yeah, because it has the element of what uh, modern people would call belief. Yeah. The kind of what you think yeah. is belief. Mm -hmm. But it goes beyond. It's got a bit of a semantic range. Yeah. It includes that. Yeah. Um, but it also has a strong emphasis on um, relational activity mm -hmm. of loyalty yeah. or a, a allegiance, as Matthew Bates mm -hmm. says. 
Yeah, I, think, I actually think Matthew Bates' understanding of this is possibly the better of the, the, those around. So, I'll just hold up this book. We're yeah. going to quote from this in a little bit, but this book, Salvation by Allegiance Alone. Uh, it's David a world, and I highly recommend. It's a world recommend. changer. Yeah. yeah, it's one of yeah. the. There's a, there's a whole <laughs> bunch of books that are floating around at the moment, which I think have been real world changers. Yeah, that's one of them. Michael Heiser's Unseen Realm. Yeah, Michael Heiser's Unseen Realm. Mm-hmm. That's that's a that's a that's not just a world changer. That's a that's a mind melter. <laughs> and then there's um, Scott McKnight's book, The King Jesus Gospel, um, and anything by him. Yeah. And then there's, you know, anti rights books. Yeah. But we're not here to talk about a whole heap of books. No. <laughs> but even um, uh, one of the things on the back mm. of this book, a recommendation it, by Scott McKnight is really great. Mm. He says, The superficiality of American evangelicalism's gospel obsession with security and assurance has led me at times to wonder if we should not teach justification by discipleship or justification by faithfulness. Yeah. But Matthew Bates has landed on a beautiful and biblically biblically sound term, allegiance. Yeah. Which when you understand it that way, there's certain Bible verses which I famously memorized when I was a kid, you know, famous verses that I didn't, didn't, it wasn't me that was famous for memorizing, but rather (laughs) they were famous verses that I memorized, one of them being, say, for instance, John 6, 29, which is after the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000. And he said, um, you know, don't waste your life working for things that don't satisfy. And then he goes on to say in verse 29, the work of God is this, to believe in the one whom, whom he has sent. Mm-hmm. And I always took that to mean that it's simply a matter, that's that's the whole thing of the Christian faith is that you just believe the true things about Jesus, that he died and he rose from the dead and that your sins are forgiven because of what he's done. If you believe that, everything is all good. Yeah. And then uh, that's the whole thing you have to do. But if we take this idea of allegiance and of of loyalty and of believing loyalty, then what it would what it would mean is the whole work of God is to give you full allegiance to Jesus Christ. Yeah. And even saying Jesus Christ means you have to acknowledge that he is the Christ, the King, the one God has anointed and appointed and given to us to follow. So the work of God is to bow the knee to Jesus, to enter into his kingdom and be one of his servants and one of his um, um, disciples. Mm. And so discipleship is definitely, it's, it's, not, it's not lazy believism. Yeah. Discipleship is not separate to the gospel. We talk no. about that in the gospel. Yeah. Yeah. Discipleship is not an added extra for you know the next level of Christianity. Yeah. It is Christianity. Yeah, but there's only one form of Christianity. It's the boss level. The Dis- boss level. Discipleship. Of discipleship to Jesus. <laughs> That's what Christianity is. Yeah. yeah. Mm. In fact, you can believe all the true things about Jesus and not be a believer. If if, the, if we take it this way. Well, James says something similar, doesn't he? He's like about oh, demons. Yeah. Yeah, he's like, "Oh, you believe there's one God? Good. Yeah. So do the demons." <laughs> That's right. <laughs> what makes you different? <laughs> That's right. <clears throat> and they certainly not giving their loyal obedience and and allegiance to Jesus. No. So this idea of belief is certainly meant to be understood in terms of a kind of an active participation mm-hmm. and obedience and trust and allegiance and giving up things like following your own way or following some other way and then giving it over to um, to Jesus. And I think if you were a Muslim person and you heard the gospel, you would understand this concept a lot more because your obedience and your allegiance is with Muhammad and with the Quran and so on. And when you hear the gospel as a, as a, as a Muslim, you, you say, I'm going to forsake that and now I'm going to give my loyalty and my allegiance to Jesus instead of, instead of Muhammad. And so I think for a Muslim who converts to Christianity, that makes a lot of sense. I think for a lot of people who've been brought up in a Western culture, they don't see that they're really forsaking something. But mm. we actually are. We have to forsake our self-rule and the king, the, you know, our skull-sized kingdoms and turn that all upside down and forsake that and then give it our full obedience and allegiance to Jesus. That's what belief means. That's what faith is. Faith is 
verbal, not just a noun. So yeah. it's uh, we've got to take it in an active way and not in a passive way. Yeah. Well, so let's talk about what faith means. Mm. I mean, we, we have been talking yeah. about that, but in a little bit in the nitty gritty. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> so faith is another one of those terms, um, like when we talked about gospel, euangelion. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, most people think of it as a religious term. Mm-hmm. It's not. It's a social term. Yeah. Uh, a Even politi- political term. Yeah. 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 Mm. I mean, or you could say it's a secular term. Yeah. Um, a euangelion or gospel was a secular term mm-hmm. that Jesus and the apostles used to describe what was going on with, yep. with Jesus and the kingdom of God. Faith is a secular term. Mm. Grace, when we get to that. Mm. Also, is a secular term. Who it's a knew? social, <laughs> it's a social um, thing, mm. a, a societal mm. um, term mm. that was used in the culture. Yeah, that then um, the biblical authors mm. used to explain stuff about God and His relationship with us. Yeah, faith is the same. Mm. Now, again. New Testament written in Greek. Mm. Greek was the the language of the empire in the first century. Mm. Um, the Greek word that's translated faith is pistis, mm. P-I-S-T-I-S. Yeah. In um, English, we have words that you can tell are related mm. because they've got the same kind of root. Like, yep. for example, run, runner, ran, running. Mm. You know, there's like noun, verb, mm. adverb, you know, yep. in there. and But they all have the same root, so we know they're connected. Mm. Um, pistis is a noun. Mm. Pistuo mm. is a verb, right? You can he- you can see that in Greek, yep. that they're linked. Mm. In English, um, the noun pistis we translate as faith mm. and the verb pistuo we translate as believe. Mm. Two totally different words. Yeah. <clears throat> and then unfortunately, the English word believe, I don't think is a good container for the meaning of that word because it, it brings us back to this idea of believing true, you know, creedal facts about about who Jesus is rather than about allegiance so much. Yeah. Mm. So when we understand that believe is the verb of faith, mm. that means believing is the application of faith, yeah. right? It's faithing. Mm. So then whatever's true of faith is true of believing mm-hmm. as a verb. Yeah. So we'll see that there's stuff in the Bible and, and, and in history we'll reference some a bit of stuff from this book um, that shows that there's a semantic range for the term faith yep. um, that has a lot more to do with – that's why Matthew Bates says allegiance is a great umbrella term for mm. it. It doesn't always mean that, mm. but as an umbrella term, yep. as a whole category, that summarizes it. Yeah, faith is a relational term. You keep faith with someone, mm. or you believe somebody, or you know. Um, I call it the Christian theory of relativity. Mm-hmm. That um, if you have faith in God, mm-hmm. it means that your entire worldview and behavior and affection and everything is relative to God. Yeah. That includes your belief. Mm-hmm. So if God everything your entire orientation is towards God. Mm. So you believe mm-hmm. giving mental assent to whatever he says and mm. whatever is true about him. Mm. He's the center of the universe in terms of your affections. Mm-hmm. He's the center of the universe in terms of your behavior and how you approach the world. Mm. Like everything is oriented towards God, that's faith. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> it covers the whole covers the whole range. Yeah, and I think another way of illustrating that would be keeping being faithful to my wife means that I'm faithful to the vows that I made to her. So when I made those vows, I entered into a covenant vow situation, which is very rare in Western culture to actually set up a covenant, but that's one of the ways we do that. You make promises and the, the um, um, promises that are given um you know whether you know whether things are good or bad and or so on, but if I am faithful to my wife, that means I keep those promises, and that is not just believing in true facts about my wife. You know that she's beautiful and she's the best person ever, and you know all that kind of thing. It's it means a lot more than that. It means I forsake other women. 
It means that I keep on trying to go back to and will reorient myself towards those vows. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, a, it's, I think, a better way of understanding it relationally. That's the kind of thing, except we also have to add to it the kind of the, the more kingdom thing as well, that we're giving our discipleship allegiance to Jesus as, as a subject of the king. So we're subjects of the king. Yes, we're also children in the family and all that, which I think has been probably overemphasized. But faith means that we are giving our full allegiance to Jesus as the first king and, the, and what he says goes. That's and part of it as well. Yeah, so when we're talking about allegiance in a more kind of a political way, it means that we're saying this is the right way to go and we're going to follow through and remain in the same way that I remain faithful to my wife and forsake others. I'm going to forsake other kings and I'm not going to have um, a kind of a, a little bit of Jesus and a little bit of Buddha and a little bit of Muhammad, you know, which some some people do. Yeah, I've even heard Christians talking affectionately about the teachings of of uh, Buddha, for instance. And I'm not saying that Buddha was had nothing to say. I'm just saying your first allegiance above all others is to Jesus and you put him number one. And logically there can only be number one. You can't share number one with somebody else. I think, I think one of the problems we have in the West is that we've got this idea of um, pluralism, that you can take a little bit of everything. But when it comes to faithfulness to Jesus and giving your allegiance to him, hes I don't think he's really big on pluralism. No. <laughs> he doesn't like sharing. He won't share his glory, as it says, I think it's in Isaiah, I, I will by no means share my glory with another. And by another, he means another God um, because he is the only true God above all the other gods. So he rules the other gods, which is a whole, you know, other thing we could talk about another time. But God is the God of gods and he will not share his status uh, with anyone else. And you mean, the very first um, of the commandments is that you put, you don't, you will, you serve no other gods and you have no idols before him. So, and that, that applies right through the whole of the scriptures, including faith in Jesus. Mm. So, um, yeah. Um, and then we've got that famous verse in Romans 10 where it talks about um, if you believe in your heart that Jesus was raised from the dead and you say with the mouth that Christ is Lord. And, of course, we think that's just some kind of little formulaic thing, but in ancient times to say Jesus is Lord is a public declaration that I am now the follower of and disciple of and um, what would be the word slave of even this person, I give everything to this person, everything I have and, and everything I am belongs now to him. Mm. So just saying Jesus is Lord is not stating some kind of theological fact. It's really giving a public declaration like a marriage vow. Um, and it's, it's also coupled with believing in your heart that Jesus was raised from the dead, which means the reason I believe and give my allegiance to Jesus is because he's proved who he is by his resurrection from the dead. Mm. So, um, And then baptism, we can talk about that another time, but just touching on it, even that was a, a declaration which was used in ancient times even by Roman soldiers, um, washing off old allegiances, putting on a new, and then making a a sacred vow in front of everyone that they're now going to be a follower of their uh, captain of their army or the emperor of the of the empire. And they were saying that, that it was almost like I cross my heart and hope to die if I break these vows. In fact, they would actually die. They wouldn't have to even, you know, even hope for it. That would just happen to them. <laughs> and so when we start falling into the same kind of language and we start making public declarations that Jesus is Lord, and we become disciples of Jesus, it's a much bigger deal in the context of the New Testament than it is in the modern church. Because mm. that's think, what to yeah. believe means. Yeah. It means to be actively loyal mm. to the exclusion of everything else. Yeah. I might read a quote from this book. Mm. I mean, it's a great book. Um, highly recommend all mm. of it. But something right, I mean, it's on page four. Yeah. 
there's something right at the beginning was like probably the biggest game changer mm. for me in this whole book. Yeah. Um, and then the rest of it kind of, you know, he backs up the point and mm. kind of proves it. But I'm going to read a um, an entire paragraph from this book, Salvation by Allegiance, alone by Matthew Bates. And he says, N.T. Wright offers a different example that helps us reconsider the first century meaning of believe mm -hmm. gospel language. Wright notes that the Jewish general Josephus, in his autobiographical recounting of the events of the Jewish-Roman War in AD 66, reports an incident where he urged a rebel leader to repent and believe in me. Now, for those who don't know, Josephus um, was a prolific writer, um, in the first century, and he's um, one of the go-to sources for first-century history in the Middle East, particularly the. Um, he was a traitor, though. I've got, I've got to throw that. He was a Jewish there. traitor. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> defected yeah. to Rome. Yeah, he, um, he could see which side was going to win, and said, "I want to be on the winning side." So yeah, <laughs> whatever. But he's like a primary source for. Mm. Um, um, you know, understanding how language was used at the time, for example. Sure. Yeah. Um, and in a way, that's why he, referencing Josephus is like important. Yeah. And if he hadn't defected, he would have been killed, and his and all of his histories would have been lost, and we would be the poorer for it. So, in a way, I guess it was okay. <laughs> all right. <laughs> I'm not going to stand in judgment of Josephus. Yeah, I am, I'm just so. going to read this quote. For okay. <laughs> So he, uh, yeah, he reports an incident where he urged a rebel leader to, in quotes, repent and believe in me, mm. using language nearly identical to what we find in the Gospel of Mark with respect to Jesus' proclamation, the kingdom of God is near, repent and believe the good news. Mm. Our own cultural experiences might lead us to think that repent means to turn away from private sins such as adultery, greed, and exploitation. Meanwhile, in Christian circles, believe is so often linked to Jesus and the forgiveness of sins that it may be hard to weigh what it means in this example featuring Josephus. But Wright's point is that Josephus was not trying to convince this rebel to turn away from private sins or to believe that God can forgive. Mm. Rather, Josephus wanted this man to join him in supporting the Jewish cause. That is, as I would put it, to show allegiance. So what repent and believe in me means for Josephus in this, in this context is turn away from your present course of action and become loyal to me. Yeah. There you go, folks. That's how those two mm. very important words, repent and believe, are yeah. used in a first century context Yeah. Um, in Greek. Yeah. Clearly, Josephus isn't trying to tell someone mm. um, have the right theological position about me. Yeah. That's not what that means. Mm. Now, if we want to um, give some other examples of how um, the word pistis, faith in Greek, um, can't just be limited to uh, modern Western ideas of belief. Mm. There's um, some examples in the Bible of God having faith. Mm which begs the question, who does God have faith in? <laughs> if that's what it means. Yeah. If faith means trust, who mm. is God trusting in? Mm. Um, it also, I mean, also with God, it doesn't mean allegiance in the same way, mm. but it does mean relational loyalty. Yeah, And allegiance is really just a term for relational loyalty mm. that to someone higher. So in this case, you can say that God is being faithful. Yeah, faithful. For the faithfulness of God, that he is um, demonstrating the fullness of his own character by being true to himself, true to his nature and true yeah. to his righteousness and so on. And that's um, a major point mm. in this discussion of faith, is that the, the word pistis mm. can either be translated as faith or faithfulness. Yeah. It's the same word. Mm. Because it carries that connotation. It mm. carries a connotation of faithfulness, mm. relational loyalty. Mm. Um, so, for example, in Romans 3, verse 3, it says, What if some did not have faith? Will their lack of faith nullify God's faithfulness? Mm. 
And in Greek, it says, what if some did not have pistis? Will their lack of pistis nullify God's pistis? Yeah. So God doesn't have faith mm. in the way of he believes in mm. some a higher power. <laughs> yeah. he's, he's talking about his faithfulness. Yeah. And in the context, it's saying, what if some did not have faith? And mm. it means, what if some were not faithful? Mm. Will their lack of being faithful nullify or essentially, will their unfaithfulness mm. nullify God's faithfulness? No. In fact, I think in other translations, mm. it does say that. Yeah. <clears throat> but that's the connotation of, of what's being said there. Mm. Because faithfulness is a viable, not just viable, it's probably um, uh, more often the better choice mm. for translating faith. Mm. And another way of illustrating this difference between belief as we understand it and faithfulness would be something like um, if we're saying that your allegiance to Jesus is the most important thing, you know, I mean, the work, of, the, the work of God is this, to believe in the one whom he has sent, and then we translate that to um, what it means to be justified. We're justified because we trust in Jesus, not because we believe in the doctrine of justification by faith. So there are a lot of people who would say that they believe in the doctrine of justification by faith, but you're not justified by believing in that doctrine. You're justified because you put your trust in Jesus and you are faithful to him and you give your first allegiance to him. And even if you don't know anything about that doctrine, you are justified. Because of your faithfulness to Jesus and your trust in Him and giving your allegiance to Him, we're literally justified by a relationship. That's that's correct. Yeah. By a positive, faithful relationship. Yeah. A lot of people say Christianity is not a religion; it's a relationship. Mm -hmm. And then I hear them talk in religious terms. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And this, uh, a lot of the time, I, when I hear people say that Christianity is not a religion, mm -hmm. they try and say. It's not about rules mm. um, and it's not about effort and striving and other things. Yeah. It's about relationship. Mm. And then they define that relationship by doctrine. Mm -hmm. I have a relationship to God because Jesus paid for my sins mm -hmm. and imputes me with his righteousness. Yeah. Well, that's not a relationship. That <laughs> sounds more like a religion to me. Yeah. <clears throat> or, or, or like a mercenary thing like that. I didn't want to marry her for her money, but it was the only way I could get it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, we're, you know, that means you're in it for what you get out of it rather than being in it because Jesus is who he says he is and he's proved that through the resurrection. Like to me, one of the most powerful stories is the guy who's crucified with Jesus on the cross and he suddenly realizes who Jesus is and he says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Mm. Now, he's not using classic words of, you know, belief. He hasn't got... He's not saying the creed or anything like that, but he's saying, I recognize you're the one. And I believe he was repenting and giving his faithful allegiance to Jesus while he was dying on the cross with him. And that to me is, um, that's not what you call a classic repentance in, in an evangelical sense. He's not being sorry for his, his peccadilloes and all the immoralities he's achieved in his life. But what he is doing is he's saying, I'm no longer going to keep my allegiance with presumably with uh, Barabbas and I'm changing my allegiance. I want you to remember me as your follower and someone who's now giving my faithfulness to you. A bit late in the day, <laughs> but, you know, better late than never. And, um, and Jesus, you know, reassures him. You know you're gonna you're gonna be with with me today in paradise, which is actually kind of a, a neat little segue to say that we're soon going to be doing something on paradise and heaven and that whole thing in the not too distant future. <laughs> so stay tuned. But anyway, yeah, that's that to me. I think is a really brilliant way of seeing uh, from a biblical perspective what faithfulness looks like in terms of repentance and beginning the, the journey of faith with Jesus. Yeah. There's another um, great example in a lot of the New Testament that shows how this word pistis um, can be translated faith or faithfulness. Mm -hmm. and it has that range and that it often means faithfulness mm -hmm. is that there's a word pairing in mm -hmm. a lot of Paul's letters, mm -hmm. um, pistis Christu. Mm -hmm. Faith Christ, yeah. and in in Greek, it's sometimes it's hard to translate um, uh, or interpret stuff because it doesn't have all these filler words. Mm -hmm. 
um, like directional words often, like of and in and to mm. kind of thing. So pistis Christu, faith Christ, could mean faith in Christ, meaning ours, yeah. or it could mean the faithfulness of Christ, mm-hmm. meaning his. Yeah. And um, biblical scholars debate that all the time. Mm-hmm. Does it, and in different places, does it mean our faith in Christ or Christ's faithfulness to us? And the reason it could be either is because faith means faithfulness. Yeah. And it could literally either direction. Yeah, it can be both ways. <clears throat> and some translations actually do translate it one way and others the other way. Yeah. Although it's been a fairly recent um, discovery. And I think the reason they translate it sometimes as the faithfulness of Christ is because of the context and the broader context of, of the sentence and the paragraph. And it makes more sense to say this is about the faithfulness of Christ rather than faith in Christ. Mm. So, yeah, it's it, it, we could be pedantic about that, but um, you, you probably can't really truly afford to be too pedantic about it. But nonetheless, the point you're making is that it can be both ways and therefore we understand the word pistis can be used, even though it seems to be a very simple little word, it's got a broad a broad usage. Yeah. Yeah. And like we said before, um, believe is a verb of mm. faith. Mm. Um, so anything that's true of faith mm. is true of believe as well. Mm. So believing is the is the verb, the outlived application of faithfulness. Yeah. Well, actually, the little story I was saying before that really illustrates this, there was a famous tightrope walker uh, called Blondin. I think he was 19th century or early 20th century, but anyway, he was famous for walking across a rope across the Niagara Falls. And one time he did, he walked across from Canada to the United States and he came back there was a big crowd of adoring people. And he said, does anyone here believe that I could carry a man on my shoulders and, and walk back across the rope across the Niagara Falls. And everyone said, we believe, we believe. And then he said, who will be that man? <laughs> and everyone went, uh, yeah, not me. <laughs> Except one guy did and that was his manager and he was willing to put his, literally put his life on the line. So that to me describes the difference between just mental assent to believing, yes, you can do these things and then actually putting yourself, trusting that person and getting on the shoulders and participating with that person in what they're doing. Mm. And to me that's a good way of understanding this uh, more verbal, uh, interactive, relational kind of faith. I mean the manager, of course, you know, he, he had skin in the game so he was pretty keen. And But he was he literally did put his faith in his um, in his. Um, um, friend, Blondin, and and did it. And I, I think that describes faithfulness from in terms of how we trust in and give our allegiance to Jesus in a, in a much more powerful way than merely believing true things. You know, yeah, God could do this. God may have been able to raise someone from the dead. Jesus may be the second member of the Trinity, all that kind of a thing. And it takes it a whole other step, a verbal step. Mm. And there's a lot more that we could say about this um, concept of faith, but once you kind of get the idea that um, really it means embodied loyalty Mm. or faithfulness, um, it makes sense of a lot of the faith and believe language in Mm. the Bible. Like James's discussion of um, faith without works is dead, where he says, if if someone says they have faith but don't live it out, Mm. it's not faith. It's dead. Mm. It's not a living faith yeah. because faith is embodied. Yeah. Was there anything more you wanted to say on this topic? No, I think it's, uh, I think we've just covered what we need to cover. It's just a slight change, it's just twisting it around. I think it's a big change personally. Well, yeah, it's, it's like a light globe that's in a socket that's not properly in yeah. and then you just twist it and boom, the light turns on. And I think that's, that's what it was like for me when I come to understand what faith and faithfulness meant from a more biblical point of view and from a social and political and and the way that was used in the in the ancient times. Yeah. yeah. And this all goes together with other things we've been talking about. It all comes back to the the big story of the kingdom of God. Yeah. The the gospel of the kingdom of God is that Jesus is coming has come to bring the reign of God back to earth and to restore humanity to our 
place as being stewards of the created order under the rulership of God. Yeah. And that is done by calling us to, as Paul says in Romans 1, okay, call to all the um, Gentiles to obedient faith, yeah. to um, faithfulness, faithfulness and loyalty and allegiance to God. Yeah expressed as faithfulness to Jesus the Messiah. Yeah. And those who live that way in faithfulness to Jesus the Messiah are justified, mm -hmm. which means they are called the righteous ones. Yeah. You are the right ones, the yeah. ones who are faithful to Jesus. Yeah. Go and read this book, yeah. Salvation by Allegiance Alone by Matthew Bates, yeah. um, and look into some of his stuff. Mm. E e Nijay Gupta is another biblical scholar who's mm. written some stuff on faith. Mm. I've only read half of his book so far, but... Yeah. Comes at it from a different angle, but similar stuff. Yeah. And uh, we'll leave it there. All so right. thanks again for watching and listening, and we'll see you next time. Okay, bye for now. <laughs>